the bullpen. The bullpen. The bullpen. The bullpen. The bullpen put the Reds in a position to walk it off and win a game. That's right. The bullpen. We're going to talk about that and a whole lot more on today's Locked on Reds. Let's go. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. We have been podcasting about the Cincinnati Reds, at least individually, for going on almost eight years total. This is our first season together. We have turned an addiction for the Cincinnati Reds into information for you. Welcome on in. If this is your first time, make sure you're subscribed because we're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen because we're free and available on all platforms. On today's episode, we are going to talk about a Reds win, a Reds one nothing win, something that I don't know that we'll see happen again this year. Hot take. I'm not sure that the Reds, well, I, I wasn't even really sure the Reds were going to pull that kind of a thing off this year at all, but hey, one nothing win. We'll talk about some roster moves that the Reds made because Guys are coming back from injury, and there's also a really strange way that the Reds are handling one injured player. Plus, we've got hug watch season coming up. We're going to tell you the ideal landing spot for each of the Reds' trade chips. But Steve, we have got to start off with the bullpen because the bullpen won the Reds' a game. Yeah, I know. You know, Moose hits the sack fly in the bottom of the ninth to walk us off, but. Moose doesn't do that. He's not in a position to do that if the bullpen doesn't pitch as well as it has. We've been malign. I mean, we've been killing this bullpen with good reason because they've been really bad this year, but we've got to shout them out. They played good last night. On a night where the Cincinnati Reds faced Max Scherzer, he goes six innings and strikes out 11, and we're talking about a walk-off win at the hands of the Reds bullpen, I would have I would have not taken that bet. I don't care what the odds would have been at <laughs> Bet Online. I would not have put any money down on that. What an amazing night! I mean, we're talking about four relief pitchers out of this Reds bullpen having to cover a lot of innings. They covered four point one innings, Jeff. That is a lot of bullpen innings for this particular bullpen, and they did it well. Yeah, uh, raise your hand if I'd have told you that the Reds bullpen had to cover 12 or more outs and you thought they'd win the game. <clears throat> All right, let's see <laughs> who would raise their hand if you said, okay, Joel Kunal, uh, Ross Detweiler, uh, Jeff Hoffman, and Hunter Strickland are going to be the reason that the Reds win a game. Nobody is raising their hand, Jeff. I mean, you know, Kuno nope. comes in, pitches a clean inning. Detweiler comes in, pitches a clean inning. Each of those guys only allowed one hit. Uh, Hoffman comes in, 1.1 innings pitch, gives up one hit, strikes out a guy. And then the fearsome closer, Hunter <laughs> Strickland comes in, gets pitches a clean I, inning, and gets the win. I mean, I, who, I, who, who would have thunk? He, 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 get, he deserves the criticism that he gets. But that was a great performance. Nine pitches, that's what you want to see. That's the kind of clean inning that we talk about when we talk about a good bullpen. Now, the Reds had a good bullpen for one night. Let's not get it twisted. This isn't something we're expecting. And because of the way that they pitched, and as much as they pitched this past night, and the fact that the Reds really don't have a dude that you really are that sold on being a good option out of the bullpen, Bet Online has some thoughts as to how bad the Mets are going to kick the Reds' butts today. But let's celebrate that fact for a minute. And, and they took the mantle because it was very obvious Nicoladolo in his return, which really I thought Nicoladolo was going to be the story come hell or high water with this game, but the bullpen kind of outshined him. But they took the mantle from him. And he actually pitched really well, too, in his return. From the IL, I, I know that he was on a pitch count and we would have loved to have seen him pitch a little bit more, but dude was working. His pitches were all over the zone. He was controlling them well. He was getting a lot of swings and misses on his curveball. His curveball, he had a 73% whiff rate on his curveball last night, just absolutely fooling this very talented Mets lineup. 
you know, you and I, we had great seats last night to, to really see the action on the baseball uh, as Lodolo was pitching. And he, he wasted no time in reminding us why there was so much hype surrounding him. And, and you're absolutely right. It was very clear. The Reds had him on a pitch count. He went 4.2 innings. He allowed three hits in those 4.2 innings. He struck out eight. He did walk three. I, I mean, you know, you would like to see him not walk anybody, but he did walk three in his first game back against major league hitters. And I'm not, I'm not surprised that that happened and I'm not concerned. Uh, but, you know, overall, Nicol Dolo really came back into this rotation. And I would I think it will serve kind of uh, as a, an energizer, as a little jolt. And I hope that that becomes infectious. I hope that, you know, carries over to what Ashcraft does tonight and gets him refocused. I hope that Hunter Green was paying attention last night <laughs> to how Nick Lodolo was mixing his pitches and how having a third pitch, how being able to keep hitters off balance really is to the benefit of the starting pitcher. Right. And, and when you talk about Graham Ashcraft pitching tonight, it's really the future. And we, we talked about this at the game last night. It's really the future against the Mets. The, the future against the present. The Mets are now the future for the Reds is Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, and Graham Ashcraft. And those are their three starters that the Reds threw out there against the Mets in this series. But I, I loved what I saw from Nick Lodolo. He looked poised. Even in the first inning, whenever we were looking at it and he had a couple of base runners that he was dealing with. And there was that moment, too, that he struck out Francisco Lindor, but Francisco Lindor immediately went over to Pete Alonso as he was walking into the batter's box and he was trying to tell him something. And then he walks over to the on deck circle with Mark Canha and he's trying to tell him something too. And we're like, did he, uh, is, is Lodolo tipping his pitches? Like what, what are they talking about? It's not, it's the first inning. They're talking about dinner plans already. Are they, it's gotta be something that he's tipping, but whatever it was, it didn't matter. It's almost as if Lodolo saw what Lindor saw and fixed it. You know, I was thinking about that, Jeff, and maybe it did exactly what Lindor wanted it to do, which is maybe it got in everybody's head. It certainly got in your head because you drove yourself nuts for the next three I, innings trying to find how Lindor was tipping his pitches. And, you know, and I did the same thing. So I think that maybe <laughs> that was the goal. Maybe maybe Lindor just wanted us got to in our he head. saw something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Lindor got in our head. No, that was that was a great night, great pitching night for the Red Legs. Uh, not not a lot to talk about on the hitting side of things, as we said. Max Scherzer got the reverse pizza himself in six innings, struck out eleven Reds batters. And uh, I was noticing on Statcast, I'm like, well, okay, it's pretty obvious that Max Scherzer pitched better than Nick Lodolo. But if you look at the whiff rate, Nick Lodolo had a better whiff rate than Max Scherzer. So I mean. Really, who was the better pitcher? No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding there. But it was a good night at the ballpark for the Reds pitching. And you know, when it comes to the bullpen that we mentioned there at the beginning, <laughs> nights like this aren't going to happen very often. But it happened last night. The Reds bullpen gave them a chance to win, and they actually capitalized. So we got to celebrate that. We got to celebrate the fact that the bullpen did something, and the Reds were able to follow that up. You know, Steve. <sighs> we got to yeah, see what was, they got tonight. <laughs> it was, it was, it was a great, it was a great night at the ballpark. You are not wrong. After one of the most unexplainable rain delays that I have ever seen occurring at the beginning of the game, shout out to three dollar <laughs> beer night at the ballpark. Let me tell you, um, you know, it was, it was a great night. I, I just, I keep continue to say how much fun I have at Great American Ballpark. But listen, before that game, the Reds made a flurry of moves uh, before things got underway. So. Uh, coming up here in just a minute, Jeff and I will break that down to see if the Reds got the perfect piece that they needed for their lineup. And if you want to get the perfect piece for that special someone in your life, head to BlueNile.com right now. Whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. You can build the engagement ring of her dreams. Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as the setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft her perfect engagement ring, and each ring ends up being one of a kind. If you're looking for fine jewelry to celebrate a special moment but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile can help. They have jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. 
And Locked On Reds listeners get $50 off a $500 or more purchase. This podcast exclusive includes engagement rings. All you have to do is use the promo code Locked On. That promo code is Locked On. That's going to get you $50 off a $500 or more purchase. Plus, every order that you place is going to be insured. It ships for free, and it arrives in discreet packaging that's not going to blow your cover and give away the surprise. Uh, you can shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueDial.com today. Thank you for making Locked on Red your first listen. We really do appreciate it. Make sure you are following the podcast on all platforms, including YouTube. If you're watching us there, make sure you've clicked that subscribe button below. If you haven't checked us out over there yet, please do so. Lots of exclusive bonus video content over there that you're not going to get anywhere else. Coming up tomorrow, uh, could the Reds and the Mets work out a trade for Joseph Daniel Votto? Hmm. We're going to check that out. Ryan Finkelstein of the Locked on Mets podcast is going to be joining us for a special crossover, and that is one of the trades he is going to propose. I can't wait to hear how that goes, Jeff. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what the Reds did before yesterday's game before we start trading guys away because they're bringing people back. Uh, Tyler Naquin back from the injured list. Max Schrock back to AAA making room for Naquin. Naquin comes off the injured list and just goes one for three with a walk. He's on base twice. Nice to have Tyler back. It was nice to have him back, and he had to be kind of shaking his head in the pregame whenever he's like, yes, I'm back in Max Scherzer's pitching. Great. Because in his first at-bat against Scherzer, Scherzer made him look silly with a slider low and away. But he looked pretty good last night, made some really good contact on a couple of pitches. I think we're going to be just fine having Tyler Naquin back in the lineup. But going from one Tyler to another. Tyler Stevenson sent out on a rehab assignment. And, you know, we've kind of been putting off this conversation for a few days because he, he went on a rehab assignment a couple of days ago. And, uh, Steve, you're shaking your head about that. I am really irritated. I don't understand. I mean, first, let's let's start with the fact that you've got Aramis Garcia as your backup catcher on this roster who's playing through an injury. He's not 100%. Yeah. And at 100%, he's nowhere near as good as Tyler Stevenson. They've had three catchers on this lineup. They got Papirski for some reason playing right now. And yet Tyler Stevenson is healthy enough to participate in a baseball game. Uh, taking that into account, whatever his deficit is from being out of the lineup, whatever struggles he would have in the lineup facing a major league pitcher, he's still going to be better than Mike Papirski in this right. lineup. It makes no sense to me why he's at AAA. Bring him up, activate him. Put him in the lineup, and he'll figure it out. I have no doubt about that. And I have a hard time believing it's something like, well, we're trying to ease him back into game action because you're just as likely to get hurt at AAA as you are in the mm -hmm. major leagues. I I don't see that at all. I'm with you. I I look at guys like Papirski, and we had Chris O'Kee, and for a moment we had three catchers on the roster because whenever Naquin was activated, Mark Colesvari was sent down. But, yeah, you had three guys on the roster. None of them have really good uh, plate discipline or the ability to hit a ball at all. And you look at Tyler Stevenson, you're like, I think with one hand he probably is a better hitter than uh, those guys with two. So I would have liked to see him. I, I think there's a little bit of just, hey, this is what we're supposed to do with a hurt player, and so they're really not having any sort of imagination with the whole thing. But, yeah, I mean, Garcia playing through an injury as well. Like, we watched him the other day catching fastballs from Hunter Green and like he would jump up because it would hit the part of his hand that was bruised and it was like why is he in there like you're <laughs> why it's, it's not as if Aramis Garcia is the second coming of Tucker Barnhart I mean he's definitely not the second coming to Johnny Bench and we can't even go to Tucker Barnhart I don't think there but I, I it's weird weird the way that they're handling this and with all of that Max Schrock got sent down like why why? I, I, I don't understand that. Max Schrock has pop. Max Schrock has power. He's got the the kind of bat that you want coming off this bench. All right. So we'd rather have him than Matt Reynolds? Or we'd rather have Matt Reynolds than Max Schrock? I, 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 I don't get that. No, and I think that, you know, there's a couple easy moves in activating Stevenson. You get Papirski out of here. I know they had Colesberry up here. 
I get making room for for Naquin with him. I just I, I'm with you. I keep Schrock. I get Stevenson back on this. You know, again, we've talked about this with Hunter Green and working on pitches. We've talked about what the Reds should do the rest of the way. They are not going to the playoffs. So let's get people up here. Let's work on things. Let's do stuff. Let's treat this as an extended instructional league for the rest of the way and get everyone ready and in top shape to head into 2023. And, you know, Aramis Garcia is not it. He is not your guy. So get Stevenson back up here, put some pop in this lineup, uh, and let's have some fun. And, and I know that everybody's argument to that is, well, you still got to win games, right? But yeah, we're not saying don't be competitive. We're just saying be competitive while also working on development. Like that's mm -hmm. the, you can go, you can do those things simultaneously. You can, you don't have to just pick one or the other. It's not black and white, whether you're going to develop or whether you're going to win. And speaking of what's going to happen the rest of the season, Max Schrock might be up here sooner th rather than later simply to replace a guy who should be traded because we're talking about hug watch season. Steve's hugging himself. I'll hug myself too because I like hugs. Hugs are good. <laughs> but when we're talking about hug watch season, we're talking about saying goodbye to some guys that we like. And Brandon Drury has become a dude that we like. I mean, he's already said his career, personal career best in home runs for an entire season. And he's done it before the all-star break. So kudos to him. Beautiful season. So high now. So high now. And with that in mind, Steve, what is your ideal landing spot for Mr. Brandon Drury? You know, I'm I'm okay with wherever they send him as long as it's not within our division because I, I hate <laughs> yeah. to see guys come back and, and beat up on us uh, within our division. But I'll tell you this about Brandon Drury. Uh, he's going to be the Reds all-star. He's going to be the guy that goes to Los Angeles and represents this team. Uh, if the Reds have any sense at all, They'll put him on that plane with his Cincinnati Reds gear. He'll go play that game. He'll wave to the crowd. He'll represent the Reds, and he'll never come back. They will trade him during the All-Star <laughs> break. His value is never going to be higher than it is right now, and we got him for nothing, for peanuts, nothing but a little bit of money. Trade him now. Uh, you know, kudos to him. He has put together a tremendous season, and he has really created for himself an opportunity to be traded to somebody, maybe sign an extension, maybe make himself some money, and contribute to a playoff contender. That's great. I mean, Brandon Drury could not have asked for anything more than what's happening for him right now. And from a red standpoint, this might be the only thing that Nick Crawl stumbled his way into getting right this season. Uh, signing Brandon Drury, he's having a breakout year. And now if he can trade him for something useful, it completes that project. And, and that's one that Nick Kroll can hang his hat on and, and point to when they ask him, what did you ever accomplish in your very short tenure, hopefully, as the Cincinnati Reds general manager? I, I look at this and I think, you know, they got a pretty interesting deal when it came to Sonny Gray for Chase Petty. Like everybody said, Chase Petty has a really high ceiling, but he also has a really low floor because it was a high school pitcher whenever he was drafted. That's kind of what I think they should be looking for in Brandon Drury. Go for a risky dude. Because I was saying, I, I think that when you look at this upcoming MLB draft, and, and I'm not an expert as to what the Reds are going to do in a draft, I mean, I want to see them take some low-risk guys, but that's about as much draft analysis as I can give you. But when I look at these trades, I think this is where you go for the really high ceiling dudes that need a little bit of development help. And I think that Brandon Drew is the perfect trade ship for that. And honestly, I'm looking at a team that they already made a deal with this offseason because the Seattle Mariners need some help in their lineup. Steve, I, I think that Brandon Jury could really provide some pop that they've been missing. And, you know, there's still a couple more prospects that the Reds didn't trade for that are there in Seattle. Not necessarily, you know, like the George Kirby's of the world who are absolutely way too expensive for just Brandon Jury and probably priced out of the Reds' ability to trade for them at all. But I think that he would be a good fit for the lineup. And why not go ahead and just complete the remolding of the Mariners to make them the <laughs> Reds West? I, I just I think that's great. You know, you know, if we get four former Reds in the lineup at the same time, can they go out in red jerseys that say Mariners on them? I think that would be great. Do they send a World Series ring to Nick Kroll? Well, that's a great <laughs> question. It doesn't matter because Bob Castellini would sell it. 
<laughs> it's exactly it's exactly true. It, it, with all these different, you know, we're talking about hug watch season, we're talking about injuries and all this other stuff and, and, and what we expect from the rest of the year, the Reds roster is going to be fluid. It's not going to be something that we're like, yes, this is the everyday eight. Definitely not. There's going to be a lot of changes for the rest of the season. You know, Steve, speaking of hug watch, Luis Castillo is a good bet to be traded. And if you are looking for a good bet, head on over to Bet Online. In fact, I've got a good bet for you tonight because Bet Online doesn't seem to like Graham Ashcraft very much. They're like disrespecting this man tonight because there's a couple of reasons. His strikeout total over under is low, it's at three and a half. I'm taking the over on that all day. Now, the VIG on that's minus 114. It's not the best of values, but. Over under three and a half strikeouts. I'm taking the over on Graham Ashtraff. Get, get four strikeouts, you hit the over. Do that all day. Bet online. Plus, Bet Online is saying you, they have the specific margins of victory for each team. The favored outcome for this game is the Mets winning by four or more runs. Now, part of that's probably to do with the fact that the Reds depleted their bullpen last night, but I also think that there's some disrespect, again, that they're throwing at Graham Ashcraft. Take advantage of what Bet Online doesn't know, and that's that Graham Ashcraft is awesome. Take the over on the strikeouts and look at some other stuff that involves Graham Ashcraft as well. And if you want to find more of those kind of good bets, head on over to BetOnline.com. Dot net because they've got you covered for everything this MLB season. They've got futures when it comes to the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, and all of that stuff that's in the offseason. Plus, they've got combat sports like boxing and MMA actually made a couple of bones on the UFC card this past weekend that I'm feeling pretty good about. You can feel pretty good about it too. Go to bet online today on your desktop or mobile device and check out all the trends and action. Bet online. Is where the game starts. Thanks again for making Locked On Reds your first listen and your first watch of the day. Make sure you're following us on Twitter because we got some fun stuff for you on Twitter as well. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three F's, like my little nameplate says right down there. You can follow Steve at S. Offenbaker with two F's, as his nameplate says, pointing at the wrong one. There we go. Or you can follow the show at Locked On Reds. All right, Steve. We started this conversation. We'd like to see Brandon Drury maybe go to Seattle, something like that. Um, Luis Castillo. There's, there's a couple of things we got to talk about. First, yes, we want to surmise as the best situation for him. What's the ideal spot for him? But before we do that, there's something we got to address because there's some rumors going around that are very unsettling to the both of us. And, I, 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 you know, before I go crazy, what are those rumors, Steve? Well, listen, I have seen in more than one place that uh, there is speculation that the Reds are very interested in packaging Mike Moustakis with Luis Castillo to get that contract off the books. And that is the absolute worst thing they can do. Look, we talked about Brandon Drury being a guy maybe you can take a flyer on somebody with. You can make a trade with him that has some risk in the return. You cannot do that with Luis Castillo, and you cannot use Luis Castillo's high value to get someone to take a Mike Moustakis Mike Mustafis, I did it again. Mike Mustakis contract that is terrible and then get limited return just to make Bob Castellini a little bit more money. They talk about moving to a Tampa model. They talk about becoming a team that constantly churns the lineup and trades guys with a couple years of team control remaining in order to bring in new prospects and continue to grow the organization a la the way that Tampa does things. Tampa does not package bad contracts with their guys and get limited return. If the Reds do this, if they package Mike Moustakis with Luis Castillo, they will have torpedoed this rebuild. They will have torpedoed this move to a new model before it ever got off the ground, before it ever got started, and Phil Castellini will be the guy to blame. 100%, because Luis Castillo is your dude. He is your gold bar whenever you're looking at the value of all these different trade chips that the Reds have. He is the guy that everybody wants. And if you're going to say, by the way, I know that you really like this nice car that I'm about to sell you. I got a couple of bags of trash that I'm going to throw on top of that. If you don't mind taking that off my hands for me, 
they're probably not going to be as excited about the deal. And because of that, you're not going to get as good of prospects back because this farm system, this organization needs as many top prospects, as many darts to throw at the board as they possibly can. If they're sitting there, and, and this is a, a thought process that I'm worried about with these rumors, if they're sitting there in the Reds front office right now and looking at their farm system and thinking, we got our guys, we're good. These are the guys that are going to build our championship team for us because they're going to all develop and they're going to all hit and they're going to all be major leaguers. Then that is absolutely foolish and they should not be running a baseball team if that's what they think because not every prospect hits as excited as we are about all these dudes that are coming up through the minor leagues neither you or i are under any delusion that every single one of them are going to hit because i i can name a whole bunch of dudes that even made it to the major leagues and didn't hit I mean, I, I remember, man, like without going through all of the different prospects, I remember back in the day really being excited about Daniel Corsino. Do you remember Daniel Corsino, Steve? I do not. And just for a more a recent reason. pertinent <laughs> example, remember that just a few short years ago, Nick Senzel was untouchable. Yeah. He, Nick Senzel was requested in that uh, JT Romuto trade when the Reds were talking to the Marlins. Yeah. And they wanted Senzel, and the Red said, no, he is untouchable. We're not doing that. So yeah. I, just you don't have to look very far to see why you need option A, option B, option C, and then something if that doesn't work out. Uh, if, they're, if they're willing to sit on their hands and say that this is the team they're going to have in 2024, they've got their guys, and Nick Carl's got his feet up on a desk somewhere in the offices of Great American Ballpark, it's going to be a disaster for this franchise. Yeah, 100%. But with that being said, as we have now put it out there, don't attach Moose's bad contract to Luis Castillo. There are some teams that are very interested in him because, well, any team that isn't interested in, interested in getting Luis Castillo is dumb. But Minnesota, I heard, is very interested. And that'd be kind of, uh, kind of strange to see both Luis Castillo and Sonny Gray pitching for the same team, but not the Reds. Um, you got the Dodgers that are interested in more pitching. You've got, I don't necessarily know that the Mets are. In fact, we'll talk with Ryan Finkelstein tomorrow. And he had a take the other day that with Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom coming back, that's like acquiring two top flight pitchers at the trade deadline. So they're probably not going to be offloading top prospects for big pitching guys. Where would you like to see Luis Castillo? Because I, I, I really am convinced that he's getting traded. And I really want him to go to somewhere where he can get some success. Kind of like what, what we saw with Johnny Cueto. I want to see that for Luis Castillo. Well, where I would like him to go is I would really like to see something materialize with the Minnesota Twins for a couple reasons. I would like to see that combination of Castillo and Gray again. I think that would be interesting. Uh, I also would like to see, as I mentioned before, him go out of the league, go over to the American League, get away right. from the Reds because I don't want – the salt in the wound of having him pitch against us a bunch. Uh, however, I'm not so sure that that's the most likely place. I think if we're looking around the landscape, the most likely place is the juggernaut that is the Los Angeles Dodgers. They're not afraid to spend money. They're not afraid to trade prospects. They're not afraid to do whatever it takes to win. And I think Luis Castillo is a needed jolt to that team's rotation. And I think they will probably be the guys that go out and make the best offer to get him. You've also got a super awesome farm system with which to pick some prospects from. So the Dodgers would be, um, I, I, I think, coveted, a coveted landing spot for Luis Castillo. Another guy that I think is going to be traded because, let's face it, the Reds need to be trading all these guys, Tyler Malley. His ideal landing spot for me, I'm looking for a team that, it, it, for him personally, obviously I want the Reds to get some good prospects back, but for him personally, I want there to be somebody who can teach him consistency because I feel like Derek Johnson has done everything he possibly can, and maybe he just needs another voice. Like, I'm not saying Derek Johnson is not a good pitching coach. He's one of the best in the league, but he needs a good stability, a guy to give him some consistency in his next landing spot. I'm not necessarily sure as to where that is, but I could see him going probably to the American League, and especially like a team, I don't know, like, 
I don't necessarily know that the Rays are a landing spot, but a team that's probably going to be a little bit more progressive with, okay, we're okay with you pitching five innings because it feels like there's a lot of teams nowadays that are still trying to pigeonhole him into a six-inning starter. You know, for me, I think, you know, circling back again to the Minnesota Twins, I think that they're Mm -hmm. a much more likely landing spot for Tyler Malley. I think that Sonny Gray might play a part in lobbying a little bit to get Tyler over there. Uh, The Twins clearly want to add an arm to that rotation. And, you know, outside the confines of Great American Ballpark over the last couple of years, Tyler has been pretty good. So I think you take all those things into account. It's a lesser prospect return. Minnesota is not going to have to pay as much to get him, but it does bolster their rotation with another very good arm. You know, maybe it's not a starter, you know, a number one kind of guy, but, you know, he can slot in as a two or three over there and be a very useful addition for them to make a postseason run. I'll be interested to see how the negotiations for that come through because there's some people that have completely differing opinions as to the package of prospects the Reds could get for Tyler Malley. There's there's a bunch of dudes on this roster that I think could bring back something. Uh, probably the only other guy that I'm really looking at uh, is Tommy Pham landing somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where that is, but do you think that he actually gets traded? Because I think the book is kind of out on him that he's good on the field, but Lord knows that, you know, carrying a conversation with him, that could bring a lot of different interesting outcomes. Listen, teams are willing to overlook a lot of things if you help them win. And I think that, you know, we talked about this yesterday. Tommy Pham on the field is fun to watch. He does things, some things really well. He's been playing great defense uh, and he's been a good bat at times in the lineup. So, Taking all those things into account, one of these teams making a postseason push will take a flyer on him. Now, like, don't get carried away with that. I don't think he's going to bring any huge return. I, I think uh, he could be a type of guy that could land you someone in a change of scenery deal. He could bring you back a guy that is a, a former prospect that just couldn't quite put it together and needs uh, maybe one last set of, of fresh eyes and a new look. He could get you somebody like that. But – I do think that he has enough value that teams will at least inquire or have a conversation about him. Yeah, because I think whenever the Reds signed him, they gambled that he was going to have a very good year and they could trade him while he's performing well. He's had an okay year. I don't think it's great by any stretch of the imagination, but a team can look at him and say, we could slot him in the lineup and you know, just tell him to wait until August or September to really start thinking about fantasy football. Uh, but, Steve, I think that's going to be a good spot for us to end our Hug Watch conversation for today. There's going to be a lot of trade rumors that we're going to be covering here on the Lockdown Reds podcast, so you're going to make sure – you're going to want to make sure and follow us because we're going to have it for you every single day day thanks again for making us your first listen today now go make locked on mlb prospects your second listen i mentioned the mlb draft earlier and saying that i know a little bit Lindsey crosby knows a lot he knows a lot about the mlb draft and you're going to want to check out his coverage of the draft as we lead up to it that's locked on mlb prospects just like locked on reds free and available on all platforms tomorrow ryan finkelstein from locked on mets joins us for a Good old-fashioned crossover where we talk about trading Joey Votto? I know. I know. That's that's a weird thought. But Ryan has an idea, and we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. Steve, it's hug watch season. And whether we actually say goodbye to Joey Votto, I'm a little bit doubtful of that. But we're going to be saying goodbye to a lot of dudes. What's that mean for uh, you and me? That means you and I are going to be watching the transactions very, very closely. We're going to be in everybody's podcast feeds every single day. And whenever there is breaking news, we will jump in with some emergency news as well. Because we're locked on Reds every single day.